Good morning. Happy Val Valentine's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. And uh, welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Jacques Gallopeau. Uh Jacques uh, is uh, Canadian, uh, received his MD at the University of Montreal, took his internship in family medicine and then his residency in internal medicine, both um, uh, in Montreal, and then undertook postgraduate fellowship, first in Hemonc at uh, New England Med Medical Center in Tufts, in Boston and the postdoctoral fellowship in gene therapy in the division of experimental hematology at St. Jude's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. He then went on to become an assistant professor and subsequently associate professor at McGill University in Canada and in 2010 was recruited to become professor of hematology and medical oncology and pediatrics at Emory School of Medicine. Uh, he also served as the director of the Emory Personalized Immunotherapy Center uh, in 2016, we were all very fortunate to recruit Dr. Gallipo, uh to our uh, School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, he's currently a visiting professor of hematology and medical oncology. He's also the director of the Advanced Cell Therapy Program for the Carbone Cancer Center. He's director of the Office of Therapeutic Discovery and Development for uh, UW ICTER and is Assistant Dean of uh, Therapeutics Discovery and Development. Uh, he's published broadly. I always like to see how people got started. And, and, and in fact, his first publication was on ventricular activation of the atrial natriuretic factor in, uh, gene in acute myocardial infarction. So he started in cardiology, published in New England Journal the first time, and then found his niche subsequently um, in hematology and cell-based therapy and, uh, and has published over 158 peer-reviewed manuscripts. He also uh, holds or has been issued provisional patents on 12 occasions now. He's been very well supported in terms of grants. Currently, NIH, uh, uh, the NIAID and the NIDDK. Um, he has sponsored three uh, FDA investigational new drug um, trials or IND trials uh, for cell-based therapy. He's been a very good citizen reviewing grants uh, for the NIH, the National Cancer Institute of Canada, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. He's a member of a number of uh, medical organizations, including uh, being a fellow in the Royal College of Physicians of Canada, and he served on a number of scientific committees and boards. Uh, including uh, for the Canadian Stem Cell Network. He is a member of the External, Advis External Advisory Board for the Canadian National Transplant Research Program. Uh, he's involved with the Foundation for the Accreditation of Cell Therapy and Regenerative Medicine Task Force, and he's co-chair of the International Society of Cell Therapy Working Group on Mesenchymal and Tissue Stem Cells. Um, in his uh, free time, in his younger days, he also served as a commission officer in Her Majesty's Canadian Armed Forces, being honorably discharged as a captain. Um, Dr. Gallipo has also been an avid teacher at all levels, and uh, I counted 24 different graduate students and postdoc trainees that he's mentored over the years. Um, he's really world-renowned in the area in which he's speaking today. Uh, I noted uh, 90 national and international talks he's given on, on this and similar topics. So we're really fortunate to have Dr. Gallipo join us today to present Grand Rounds entitled Cell Therapies and Academic Health Centers, How Scientific Inquiry Informs First in Human uh, Trials. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gallipo. Dr. Pager, thank you so much for the kind introduction, so let's uh, just uh, jump in. So uh, when most of you think of uh, cell therapy, you'll think about uh, bone marrow transplant, the uh, kind of stuff that uh, Walt Longo, Mark Junkett do, we do a couple of hundred a year here. And most large academic health centers do that. That's standard medical practice. What I'm talking about today is more the experimental-based uh, cell therapies. And these are Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, uh, I'm talking about um, experimental cell therapies where, well, they're just that, experimental where you don't use traditional cells with therapeutic intent. And these are the number of clinical trials. These are not 
about publications or mouse studies, clinical trials in humans, both in the industry and academia, is very active in this space. The types of ailments that are targeted by this are predominantly cancer, neurology, and a smattering of very many other things, and you could probably find your, your preferred category. Now, amongst these experimental cell therapies platforms being develop, developed, the queen am among them is mesenchymostromal cells. You'll see T cells, and you've heard about CAR T cells and DILs, and then again, you have a bunch of other types of cell platforms. Some of them are more aspirational, like embryonic stem cells and the like, because there are very few studies compared to what's going on with these so-called uh, adult-derived cells. So mesenchymal stromal cells, that's my field of expertise. The best studied are the ones that come from your bone marrow. Now, endogenously, all of you have mesenchymal stromal cells, but they're vanishingly rare in your bone marrow. They're distinct from hematopoietic stem cells. So mesenchymal cells are more structural niche cells that support hematopoietic cells, but also act as immune cops for the bone marrow. There's no lymph nodes in the bone marrow, but there are a lot of lymphocytes in the bone marrow, and they control circulation. And their frequency is low, one out of 100,000 nucleated cells. So they're rare cells in your bone marrow that play a very important and potent role, and they express Now, it's been found since that are, there are MSC-like cells in all your viscera. Because pericytes, which are cells that wrap around blood vessels after the close of capillary venue, are basically MSCs by another name. It's not working? No. Okay. Uh, it's not working. Oh, sorry about that. Because I want to do the, uh, like the lecturer thing and sort of go up and down here. Maybe it can just bellow a little bit harder. Anyway, so the uh, pericytes are MSCs uh, uh, by another name, and you can find those uh, richly in adipose tissue along everywhere else where you have capillaries. More than a quarter century ago, these cells were studied initially by a Russian guy, Frydenstein, as a surrogate of uh, bone formation because these cells can differentiate into uh, bone, uh, fat, the countersite, they're mesenchymal progenitors. But what was discovered laterally is these cells have, again, the potent immune suppressive properties. Now, very early on, what was discovered was that I could take uh, five cc's of your bone marrow, just five cc's, it's a better standard uh, bone marrow culture, culture in vitro, and uh, these rare cells, when unleashed from the bone And I can grow up to 10 billion of your cells in about a couple of weeks. That's a gram of tissue. And if I continue the proliferation, oh, substitute here. There we go. That one works. There we go. Sorry, guys. Uh, so. It, I can actually take the cells from this young lady and continue expanding them for a month or longer, and I can generate a kilogram of your cells. So here you have a solution looking for a problem to fix. So now you can grow a large amount of cells from strapping youth, harvest them, put them in a bag, and use them for transfusional purposes for gender medicine. That was the first thing, people were doing this for bone replacement. But because of their immune and niche properties, because of factors they release, for immune modulation. So the first piece of data that suggested that mesenchymal cells could be immune modulatory was an experiment done by a private outfit called Osiris, where they took a, a monkey and they would take the skin of another monkey and put it on the monkey's forearm. And if you do that and it's allogeneic, skin is really immunogenic, immunogenic. After seven days, the skin drops off. But if they infused mesenchymal cells IV the monkey after they put the skin graft, it took up to 11 days for the skin to get rejected. So this was the first sort of in vivo data that mesenchymal stromal cells could be uh, immune suppressive where they were replicating their in, uh, endogenous properties. Now, the Swedes are bold, and 
and uh, their regulatory environment in Europe is such that you can do compassionate use of novel cell therapies, a bit like, like the right to try legislation, but they've been doing that for a long time in Europe. So Katerina LeBlanc is a good friend of mine, MD, PhD immunologist at the, the Karolinska Institute, and she's a transplanter. And a life-threatening complication of bone marrow transplant, allogeneic, is the donor T cells attack your skin, your gut, your liver, you get catastrophic bloody diarrhea, you die. That's severe graft versus so. So this young boy had leukemia, had a bone marrow transplant, and developed diarrhea. This is diarrhea volumes, the uh, white dots, and liver dysfunction as a surrogate bilirubin. And the kid had severe graft versus so, death sentence. Katerina, without any mouse data, just the in vitro data, went to the boy's mom, collected mom's marrow, grew out mom's mesenchymal cells, and gave him IV to the boy at a dose of 2 million cells per kilo. The GVH responded. After about 150 days, there was a relapsed GVH, and she gave a second dose of mom's mesenchymal cells. And the boy went in remission, which was in duration. Eventually, the boy relapsed his leukemia and went on to die. But this was sort of like a Helen the face that launched a 1,000 chips. This launched a whole series of studies examining mesenchymal cells to treat graft-versus-host disease, predominantly in Europe, all academic studies which all had very encouraging positive data. More than 60%, 70% of subjects receiving mesenchymal cells or GVH was improving. So the logical next step then is to deploy this at an industrial scale that, so you can benefit everybody in the world that has graft versus so. So a private outfit called the Cyrus basically went back to strapping your youth that would give you 200 bucks, and they would take out a couple of 100 cc's of your bone marrow, and they will grow up those kilos of cells from a couple of healthy youths. But of course, being a company, they were promising MSCs would do everything and anything for everybody. The only thing that's not listed there is a male pattern baldness, but that's a different question. And uh, this is a slide from their uh, website. So what I'm saying, 10,000, I'm not using a pleonasm for the purpose of presentation. They literally, from one adult donor, would generate 10,000 doses. And the idea, which was logical, you freeze those away, and you can ship them to the East Arkansas Cancer Center, and if ever somebody there gets graft versus host, you just thaw the cells, give it to the person, and fix their graft versus host disease. They performed a prospective randomized phase three study. And the primary endpoint was if you had bad GVH and I gave you MSCs, would you remain in complete remission of GVH after 28 days? And they did not meet their primary endpoint of efficacy. Why am I showing you an abstract? Because they never published their data. They presented this as an abstract at a national meeting. Well, that's industry. But they don't, did not meet their primary end point. Another company called uh, uh, Athersis has another MSC-like product called MAPCs. It's just jargon for IP purposes. And here they tested the utility of their MAPCs for the treatment of ulcerative colitis, an inflammatory disorder. And they did not meet their primary endpoint of efficacy. April was a very bad month for this company because in April 2015, using the same product, they tested it for stroke, a tissue injury syndrome, and they did not meet their primary endpoint of efficacy. So what's going on here? So I haven't shown you any mouse data. I've published a lot of mouse data. And here's a summary of mouse data. There are more than 5,000 published reports that MSCs will cure everything in mice. It works. Published in top-tier journal, The Nature Sisters, Science, and everything else in between. However, when we're doing mouse experiments in the lab, we always use mouse uh, donor MSCs from genetically identical donors. So it's a bit like using your own as opposed to taking somebody else's. Also, the MSCs that we use uh, are collected fresh from culture. You know, we grow them as a crop in the Petri dish, as I told you. The only time graduate students will willingly come to the lab on a Sunday night is because they have to feed their cells. Because the day after, they're going to harvest them to give them to mice. You know, they read books to their cells, they sing songs to their cells. Whereas what was done in industry was almost all the studies are allogeneic. And almost all the studies used frozen cells that they would thaw at the bedside and then give to the patient IV. Now, 
A second year graduate student in cell biology will tell you, well, duh. Okay, let's come back to that. So the question then is, let's think about the failure analysis. So the MBA type said, for this to make a buck, you have to freeze a zillion doses and ship them out to East Arkansas, where they just freeze them at the bedside simply. You can't use fresh stuff. But the question is, are thawed allogeneic cells the same as fresh autologous? Now, there are other things that may impact uh, the fitness. And I want to talk about immunogenicity. But first, let's talk about the variance between donors. So this is a cartoon of a mesenchymal cell in the Petri dish. And they, there are many factors that have been found to be immune suppressive. But the thing you need to remember is MSCs are plastic. They are not static. They respond to the environmental cues of inflammation. And it markedly influences their secreto of what they produce. Now, since they're immune suppressive, and that's their default functionality, we interrogated what were the canonical immune suppressive molecules they could produce. And IL-10, TGF-beta, IDO, COX-2, I'm just mentioning everybody, are classic immune suppressive uh, uh, enzymes or genes. And what we found using MSCs from normal volunteers before and after interferon gamma, that MSCs massively upregulate the expression of two genes, COX-2 and IDO-1. And this is RNA, so we validated by showing that protein was upregulated. But here's the key point. If I take the cells from this young lady, and I put them up here without interferon gamma, with interferon gamma, I get upregulation of IDO. And if I take Dr. Page's cells and I do the same experiment, I can get a different level of magnitude of upregulation of IDO. So if I normalize that to a loading control, what we found was the T cell proliferation inhibition was more increased as there was more IDO. Makes sense. So basically, if you're a good IDO inducer, your cells are able to block T cells more efficiently. If you're a poor IDO inducer, they block less efficiently. Now, if Osiris grew the cells up from a donor that's of Rick's ilk, they're in trouble because all the 10,000 cells they manufactured are poor inducers. And they didn't select based on biology because the assumption was it was all the same. Now, cells are way more complicated than just one enzyme. And this is just to give you an idea that if we interrogate uh, using uh, microchip technology MSCs for the expression of a wide array of immunomodulatory genes, the presence of interferon gamma versus uh, controls, MSCs upregulate significantly and substantially a wide array of molecules that are, so this is not a one-trick pony. These cells have evolved to produce a matrix of factors that are immunomodulatory. Not only that, they will upregulate uh, HLA class 1, HLA class 2, but PDL1. So these cells express PDL1 for the non cognoscenti. You know when you do checkpoint blockade in cancer? That's when you're trying to checkpoint blockade. Is this is an immune suppressive molecule. So in this slide, it's a very simple cartoon. It sort of summarizes 10 years of work, which is a little bit embarrassing, but anyway. So MSCs, you stimulate with interferon gamma, they upregulate IDO, they upregulate PDL1. IDO catabolizes tryptophan to kinurenin, which this small molecule blocks T cells and monocytes. But MSCs also produce an array of molecules that directly interact with tissue man monocyte macrophages, and these become licensed or skewed towards an M2 IL-10 producing phenotype. And this is very, very immune suppressive. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, you like to have a lot of this around to fix you. The other thing, the big lie, was industry at first, the MBA types, were selling the story that if I were to take Dr. Page's cells and grow them in Petri dish, I could give them to everybody in the room and nobody would immune reject them. They were so-called immune privilege, magically so. So we tested that hypothesis. So the thing that's important to know, MSCs express MHC class one and can express MHC class two, which are, you know, MHC mismatch, like any somatic tissue. So to test the hypothesis if the cells were truly immune privileged, we just use a, a trick. We use MSCs derived from black mice, black six, which are completely MHC mismatched from white mice. So just for the sake of conversation, we're using black white icons, so full mismatch. And what we did is we genetically engineered the MSCs from the black mice to produce erythropoietin, 
They don't do that naturally. The purpose of which was that if you put EPO producing MSCs in a mouse, you can use as a surrogate the survival of the cells, you measure their hematocrit. And of course, you know, if mice do cycle racing, that could be useful, but that's a different story. So this is the hematocrit over time of black six mice that receive Syngenic, autologous MSCs that make EPO, the hematocrit goes up, 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 and stays up for a long time. So the cardiologists are saying, Gallopo, their hematocrit is almost 100%. How come they don't stroke out? Well, mice tolerate it. I couldn't do that in a person, of course. So, positive control. But if I took black 6 MSCs making EPO to bulb cirrusipine, that's immune competent MHC mismatch, hematocrit goes up and goes down to baseline. If you give, to give a second dose, and the spaghetti plot is individual mice. You see the magnitude and duration is reduced. A third dose completely lost. This is a classic pattern of alloimmunization. The mice were developing an immune reaction against a mismatched MSEs. And some of you were challenging them and you, they were rejecting them quicker and quicker again. And this data was uh, replicated by other groups that showed that MSEs are immune to rejecting a wide array of settings, including following injections straight to the brain, which is so-called immune, immune privilege site. Another point, culture expansion. So these cells are primary, normal, natural cells from your bone marrow. They're not a cell line. So they have a tendency to age in vivo, in vitro. Most academic trials done in Europe utilize cells that were from one donor, they would manufacture five doses. Whereas in industry, from one donor, they manufacture 10,000 doses. So are the cells at the end of fitness the same? So I take bone marrow. I told you I could expand mesenchymal cells in a Petri dish. But after expansion, they will enter replicative senescence. It's sort of an accelerated cellular aging in vitro. So the question we ask, are these the same? So basically what I'm showing here is if you take MSCs and you split them in a Petri dish, they grow. You see them at low density, they grow. You see them at low density, then they stop growing. This is the phase of replicative senescence. They become big fat cells. They express enzymes like uh, beta-galactosidase. And this is the big fat phenotype of forward side scatter. And all the cells are now in G0, which is a genetic marker of senescence. The cell surface markers of replicative and senescent cells is identical. So if you were to take an industrial product and just interrogate the spots expressed by the cell, they're the same. But if we do a gene expression analysis, what we found was that uh, uh, replicative fit versus senescent cells, comparing them with and without interferon gamma, there was a big difference in the ability of senescent cells to respond to interferon gamma stating that their cell biochemistry is distinct. And I would propose to this audience that the industrial products that were being given was really a senescent product with compared fitness. And we went on to show that the senescent cells, so this is a, just a readout for T-cell proliferation blockade in vitro. This is T-cell, Ki67 is a marker for cell dividing. So unstimulated T-cells don't proliferate, stimulated T-cells do proliferate, and if you add in Fit MSCs, you block proliferation, and senescent MSCs have no effect whatsoever. And this is just uh, different dilutions, showing that senescent MSCs are totally unable to block cells in vitro. So senescent MSCs have an intact phenotype, they have a blunted interferon gamma response. And retrospective data from Europe, where they have a lot of uh, data using MSCs for graft versus cells, they saw that retrospectively, the clinical outcome was worse when patients received MSCs that were late passage or grown longer than early passage. Okay, for the non-cell biologists in the audience, if there's one thing I want you to remember about today, that's the core lesson, is that stem cells are like sushi. Fresh is best. Now what do I mean by that? I told you that all the positive data in animal models always use syngenic or the equivalent metallogous cells that were harvested fresh, maintained scrupulously by students who want to graduate very badly. 
All the human clinical trials used frozen cells out of convenience because they were going for the Hail Mary for the quick buck. So our thought the same as life. So if you take a, a cell MSCs, human MSCs in culture, live, and you interrogate them for the content of uh, dead or dying cells, there's always a little bit because these cells grow and there's always some cell death. But take them out straight out of the freezer and look at this life dead content. Of course, freezing kills off a part of the cells. You can see that here. Tripan blue doesn't detect that as well as this more sophisticated flow readout. And what we found was that using, again, this T cell proliferation assay, no MSCs, you had live MSCs and blocks T cell proliferation. You use the exact same cells you took outside of the freezer, the same way we do in people, don't work no more. And this is just uh, uh, those response. What we showed here, now this is a bar graph. So this is T cell proliferation in vitro. If you use thawed cells, it doesn't block at all. But if those thawed cells, you put them back in culture, allow them to recover emotionally from the injury of thaw, they fully redeploy their functionality. And that takes only 24 hours. So there's nothing intrinsically bad about freezing. It's all about the thawing. Why is that so? When we take thawed cells and stimulate them with interferon gamma, they're unable to upregulate that key enzyme, IDO. Whereas if we just wait a day after thawing them, they can upregulate IDO. Why is that so? Interferon gamma binds to its receptor, leads to phosphostat one dimerization and a transcriptional response. And what we showed was that thought MSC still expressed interferon gamma receptor, but they have a blunted phosphostat one response. The machinery downstream of the switch don't work no more. Why is that so? Because the cells, now this will be counterintuitive, undergo a heat shock response. So heat shock, in the old days, you would take cells and you grow them in a lab in a petri dish at 37 degrees, your body, human temperature. If you raise the temperature up to 42 degrees, there's a heat shock response, which is a bunch of proteins that go up to protect the cell from further damage. And what we did is we used the mesenchymal cells from three normal volunteers and interrogated the RNA of a whole bunch of H heat shock proteins, and we saw that there was a inducible and reversible heat shock response after thaw. C0 in 24 hours. So basically, you thaw cells, they're all messed up, they respond physiologically to the injury by upregulating heat shock proteins. And those proteins are to metabolism what P53 is to DNA. It's basically stop everything, let's repair ourselves before we engage in anything fancy schmancy like immune modulation. Once we're repaired, we move on. So all of this fits. So what about homing? So again, I told you about thawed cells, live cells, and we did an experiment asking if you inject thawed cells straight out of the freezer, IV in a mouse, the way we do in people, are the cells, can you detect them in vivo? Is our half-life in vivo the same? And the answer is, no, it's not. So you inject live cells, and you can detect them in the lung of the mice after 24 hours. That's sort of our read use thought cells, we can't detect them in the lung of the mice after 24 hours. We can't detect the cells anywhere in the mouse after 24 hours. So the thought cells get cleared in an accelerated way. And it's not because they shed adhesion molecules. This is just a bunch of adhesion molecules that we interrogated in fresh and thought cells, and we saw no difference. However, these cells, these mesenchymal cells, are anchorage dependent. They have to stick to things that are mesenchymal, and they have bones of sorts, which is the cytoskeleton. And when you thaw, when you freeze cells, the cells undergo what's called a process called vitrification. It's descriptive. But that completely depolymerizes all the F actin and cytoskeleton. And that has a huge impact on functionality. So live cells attached to plastic, the red phalloidine stain picks up the cytoskeleton. But thought cells, their cytoskeleton is completely messed up and much less abundant. So we tested the hypothesis, if you took live cells and treat them with a drug that depolymerizes the F actin cytoskeleton. They're not thawed, they're not killed, it's just that like we broke their bones. And inject those IV, what happens? And what we found was that cells treated with a cytokalase net were not engrafting. So clearly here, thawing induces 
key chart, but also disrupts uh, the cellular architecture in such a manner that it impacts their distribution in the half-life of vivo. Now, a group in the Netherlands, again, Katarina's group, showed that if you put mesenchymal cells, you put whole blood on top, it will generate a clotting reaction because the mesenchymal cells express tissue factor. But if you use thawed cells in blood, the clotting reaction is markedly augmented. So they create blood clots. And they become susceptible to complement mediated lysis. So again, thawed cells are quite fragilized relative to live cells. And lastly, we recently published that thawed cells are susceptible to T cell killing just by bystander effect in vitro. So, there's nothing wrong with freezing. It's all about the thawing. So let's just recap about the thawing. So thawed cells are undergoing heat shock response, they're susceptible to T cell killing, they're susceptible to complement mediated lysis, the enhanced coagulation, you have abnormal membranes, abnormal cytoskeleton, but otherwise they're perfectly okay. The key here is if you put it back in culture, you fully restore their properties. So fresh is best, but fit is fine. So all this data informs a hypothesis-driven remedy to the follies of industry. So when possible, you'd like to use autologous cells rather than somebody else's. That makes sense. You'd like to maximize fitness. So if they're frozen, you want to culture rescue them or adapt in a way that you mitigate the heat shock response. And you need a rational selection of subjects that based on biomarkers you think are poised to respond. So I think this creates an opportunity for us academics to bolt on science to phenomenological traditional pharmaceutical approaches to learn from the success, but to learn from the failure as to improve the platform. So here, the key is to, and the narrative I'm going to pursue now is personalized cell therapies, autologous, for two reasons, because I think immunologically makes a lot of sense. But also it's a niche for us to develop because industry isn't so much interested in that because they want more sort of to grow up 10,000 doses and so on and so forth. So we're launching here an advanced cell therapy program which is meant to be healthcare integrated. So the program is not going to be built in a facility somewhere in Arlington doing mouse work. It's here embedded in the hospital integrated to facilitate first human uh, clinical trials. So we had to follow guidance. You can't improvise this. And the FDA actually provides guidance on how they tell us, we want you academics to be engaged in manufacturing to do first human studies so we can learn about these platforms. So Payman uh, and uh, Walt basically were able to get monies from UW Health to build a facility which is embedded in the hospital, G-Wing, by the cell processing lab, which is ISO 7, which will allow us to manufacture pharmaceutical grade cells that are more than minimal manipulated. The last one is jargon from the regulator because you need an IND from the FDA if you do that. So here, manufacturing, it's not rocket science. It's stuff that a summer student can do, but it's just the administration regulation. So we collect marrow, we fight all it, put it in flasks, you grow it up, you harvest a cell, you have a product. And the principles that we need to adopt is it needs to be simple, robust, and economical because a headwind to first human studies done within academic health centers is that you can't cost yourself out of it. You have to be mindful that we're in a beer income and we have to be careful about champagne tastes. So I went to uh, Emory in 2009. There was no experimental cell therapy program. It's Georgia. They really, the whole stem cell thing just flew by them. They never touched it. I went there and established using mesenchymal cells. And within uh, three years, uh, two and a half years of my arrival, we got our first IND. So we did everything from building a facility, staffing it, validation runs, making a proposal to the FDA, got the IND, which led to a clinical trial under IRB where we used autologous cells to treat Crohn's disease. They were fresh, autologous. Our first patient was treated in March 2013. Got our 
twelfth and last patient in 2015. These were all patients that had biologics refractory Crohn's disease. We collected some of their marrow, grew up their cells, would take two to three weeks. The FDA only allowed us to give one dose because they felt this was a first in human, they didn't want to do multi-dosing. And we gave either two million cells per kilo of your cells, five million cells per kilo, or ten million. So it's a dose escalation. I'm thinking like an oncologist here. And we saw that the phenotype of the cells was the same across the board. We showed that a molecular genetic basis that they could respond to Tifron gamma and upregulate uh, IDO. We showed that in vitro, the cells of all our subjects were able to suppress T cells in vitro. And we had published papers showing that MSCs from subjects with Crohn's disease are immunologically indistinguishable from normal. And here are the clinical outcome. This was uh, published recently. And this is uh, CDAI, Crohn's disease activity index. It's sort of a measure of diarrhea, abdominal pain, uh, disability, so it's a clinical index. And this is uh, four patients that got the low, medium, and high dose. And we had, even though they only got one dose, we had uh, three deep responders where the CDAI score increased significantly. These are, uh, felt, the, this is a typical endpoint for a deep response for pharmaceutical studies. These deep responses, though, were transient. They lasted three to four weeks. The patient went back to baseline. But the way we think about mesenchymal cells, it's not a silver bullet. It is going to be sort of kind of like biologics and Remicade. You're going to have to give these sales uh, iteratively to have a sustained effect. We did get, we did see one patient develop appendicitis, a C. diff, or worsening Crohn's. We say possibly related because we have to be, pardon the pun, more Catholic than the Pope here when you disclose the FDA. But these are common uh, the, uh, problems that occur in Crohn's disease. So we're, we're not that certain it was related. And again, this was published in 2016. So from not the first in human to a published study, three years, all done with intramural foundation grants, seed grants. If we can do this at Emory, we can do this here. So what's the pipeline? Where do we go with this? So let's think about a mesenchymal stromal cell. So uh, Dr. Page brought me here because I understand cell therapy writ large. I'm an expert in MSC more specifically. I have INDs and MSCs. The low-hanging fruit is for me to bring those INDs here and to deploy the use of mesenchymal cells for other ailments. Now you understand by their mechanism of action that these cells could be really useful for a wide array of ailments where there are autoimmune inflammatory tissue injury being involved. So in bone marrow transplant and transplant tolerance, talking with uh, Mark about preventing and treating graft versus host disease or to ameliorate ameliorating graftment. It can also be utilized to induce tolerance in solid organ transplantation. And we're talking to the transplant surgeons here. Immune and inflammatory disorders. Obvious low, obvious low hanging fruit would be, of course, IBD and sister ailments, but also a whole array of autoimmune disorders, RA, SLE, make your pick. Again, the platform works in a generic way. The specific ailment is not as important. I, it is important, but you understand what it is. And of course, steroid resistant airway disease, big expertise on site here. And lastly, acute tissue injury syndromes. A surgical resident will tell you that healing cannot occur in the setting of inflammation, especially infection. A wound won't heal. If you heal the infection, the wound will heal. Tissue injury is the same thing. There's a strong inflammatory response to tissue injury mopping up all the dead necrotic cells, and that will impede the ability of endogenous progenitor cells to lead to tissue uh, repair. And acute tissue injury syndromes include our, our favorites, MI, stroke, acute kidney injury, just to name a few, ARDS, sepsis. But this, the idea here is not for this to be a one pony show. There is a pipeline of shovel ready cell-based technology. When I say shovel-ready, shovel-ready for first and human. Uh, quite a few in cancer cell immunotherapy. And K cells, and Paul Sandel is like an international maven in this space. Gamma Delta T cells, Otto Mario, another uh, maven in this space. B cells, uh, Doug McNeil, 
These are all cell-based platforms where there's compelling preclinical animal data that you can move forward in people. And the common thread here is I'm taking your cells, blood or marrow, and I bring them in the lab, and I alter their biology, I augment them by adding cytokines or ingredients to cook them up, and I give back your cells to you with therapeutic intent. So what's the payoff? Uh, one of the very attractive things, and I've told this to uh, Rick quite a few times about uh, me coming to UW from where I was before is, collectively the university has drunk the Kool-Aid of cell therapies. But from the basic science perspective, the, the width and the depth of the science on campus and the cell technology space is world class. What is lacking is reducing this to practice, to MacGyver it in such a way that you can take these ideas and put it in people and draw benefit from it. There are a lot of technologies out there that are likely to have a significant impact on human outcomes, but it'll never be developed by pharma because the, the return on investment isn't there. And I, I can't blame them. You know, I have a retirement fund with pharma stock there. But we can take ownership of developing and deploying technologies like SEP technologies that may have a meaningful impact on human outcomes that otherwise would not be developed. Obviously, there would be a reputational gain. You know, uh, Alan Kaplan is all about UW Health becoming a medical destination. And you need to have your whiz bank surgeon and your genius cardiologist and others that, you know, you can highlight, but you it's nice to have a handful of technologies that are homegrown, homegrown, that you have ownership of as part of this uh, reputational gain. And uh, by the way, for those who don't know, the uh, U.S. World News Report ranking hospitals, reputation is actually one of the big score metrics there. Now, some of these technologies may be eventually spun out in a company, and that's fine. I'm all for that. There's nothing wrong with that. And you have to actually have to be mindful that when we move forward, you're not building bridges to nowhere. So if something works, there's nothing more frustrating. You do a first in human, it's really promising, and then stop. I think some of these technologies might be well developed as uh, cell therapies the way we do for bone marrow transplant, the six degrees of separation. It's part of the buffet of services we offer of platforms that improve human outcomes for solid organ transplant, BMT, and the rest. That's why it's embedded in the hospital with a vision of this being part of what we do five, ten years from now. And of course, there's a unique training opportunity. The PI of the clinical trial I showed you was a K-funded investigator that uh, she was, she wanted to do something. She was a gastroenterologist that was a distinct, she could take ownership of. So from a K to K08 to postdocs to graduate students to undergrads, there's unique training along the full spectrum. Uh, of course, I haven't touched the pipette man in about, oh, I don't know, 20 years. So this was my group uh, back at McGill. I was at McGill University for 13 years before I went to Emory at the Lady Davis Institute. So a lot of the uh, initial work done with vesicable cells was done by Moira Francois, who's actually now in the UK. And then moved on to Emory where we built the team. And uh, there, uh, Raghavan Chinaduri has done a, a lot of the work that you've seen today, Ian Copeland and Marco Garcia as well. And here I am since September 1st building a new team. Team members are here, the team is growing. We're recruiting postdocs, undergrads, fellows that want to do something different with their research years. And the mantra that I want to push forward is universities are genius at discovery. And UWU is a top NSF funded institution. You knock this one out of the park. Universities are meh at development. Virtually absent in deployment. And we've all seen the mini budget that came out yesterday. It's a brave new world. Look, the way to think about it is you do the judo roll. And 
funding for all this, and we can, you know, a hundred dogs will be barking at the door of the NIH for their part of the pie. I don't think that's a remedy in the future. I think the remedy in the future is for institutions such as ours to take leadership and take ownership of this part, which opens up brand new doors and opportunities for us to be able to have a real impact on human outcomes. And again, I'm Canadian, and Rick, one of the last things I told you that I find attractive about this whole Wisconsin idea thing. I love that, yeah. being Canadian, of course. And I believe it's our fiduciary responsibility to take discoveries and make something out of it that will impact human outcomes. And to just say, not my problem, let Pharma deal with it, is not good enough anymore. And because of the way things are evolving from a funding perspective, actually that creates an opportunity, because all universities say this. If we do that, I think we're going to be in good shape. So I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacques. I'll ask you to call on the audience and please re repeat the questions. is uh, could there be uh, uh, eventually an acquired uh, refractoriness to the use of zinc cells clinically? That question hasn't been answered yet in clinical trials. In murine models, uh, typically most disease models in mice uh, play themselves out uh, very quickly because mice are relatively short-lived, so there's, you can only go so far interrogating when is it that patients become refractory or subject, and so that hasn't been tested out. I would foreshadow that if you used allogeneic or, you know, your cells for everybody in the room, that that phenomenon of refractiveness will occur, invariably. If you use your own cells, it may occur, but I would postulate it would take much, much longer. Sir? So, um, uh, there's actually three steps to this. This is a, what are the what are the relevant presentation? Uh, uh, we kind of see it in some pressing therapy. from an ID specialist, uh, to summarize your question, are these cells tunable in regards to how you can uh, deploy their activity? And I didn't show my slide of MSC's version 2.0. So what I talked about here is probably the first generation, just a crop of mesenchymal cells that aren't stimulated just the way they are. What we've published and others have found, if you stimulate the cells in vitro with a TLR agonist versus interferon gamma, versus TNF-alpha, you deploy a different response to those from the cells in regards to which cytokines, chemokines get upregulated and downregulated. So at the end, even though you start off with an MSC platform, all depending upon how you augment them in vitro using distinct cytokines or stimuli, you'll get different outputs. And I would propose, and that's actually a hypothesis we're testing right now in mice, which is from your basic tofu ingredient, how many different dishes can you make out of it addressing specific ailments based on targeting innate immunity, adaptive immunity, maladaptive immunity? So there is a, a tunable aspect of this for mesenchymal cells in particular. But of course, these other cell therapy platforms we're talking about, NK cells, B cells, T cells, the same concept could be applied there as well, and that's part of the pipeline. Okay? So, again, in the autologous setting, it's sort of cast in stone if I use your cells for your, yourself. Now, there are, these cells will express uh, sex hormone receptors. And there's a difference in the biology, especially for osteogenesis, between 
uh, uh, male and female, but mostly it has to do not so much with the cell's response, but rather which hormone you expose the cell to. So if I take your mesenchymal cells and expose them to testosterone, I would have the same response if I were to take this young man's cells to testosterone. But if I were to take his cells and expose them to estrogen, have the same response that your cells have to estrogen. So the key is really not the cell in itself, it being hardwired to have a different footprint. It's how it responds to its meteor. These are very meteor responsive cells. I, I forgot to repeat the question. The question was, if you had cells from a female donor or a male donor, is there a difference in the of biology? Uh, So, uh, the question being posed uh, by Dr. Uh, Jamali, and I can say his name because I would think, is uh, where do the cells go and how can you track them? So, this has been done in uh, mice, rats, and monkeys using uh, gene labeled cells, and you can do fancy do that stuff. When you give cells IV, okay, medical students, if you give cells IV, what's the first capillary bed encounter? Lung. So, they all microemboli so long. So after 24 hours, 95 to 99 percent of the cell content is trapped in the lung. And then secondarily, there can be some redistribution, a little bit to the spleen, liver, a trace, trace, trace to the bone marrow. And after probably no more than seven days, after IV, you can't detect them anymore. If you have a site of inflammation or cancer, a small subset will help to that because of a chemokine gradient effect. Now, you can also give these cells IP intraperitoneally. And they'll persist much longer because they're not subjected to the circulation and the clotting effect and clearance. You can also give these cells intramuscularly. And there's a company called Pluristem in Israel that does that. You can give them subcutaneously embedded in a matrix. These cells, given intraperitoneally, IM or in a matrix, can persist for months locally where you delivered them. The point you're raising, could you alter the clinical outcome based on if you gave the cells IV versus IP, for example? And I believe you're onto something. The reason cells were given IV is out of sheer convenience. Because the first industrial trials were looking for the quick hit and the most practical way for the East Arkansas Center to give thought embassies first to thaw the bag in the mid-site. And that's literally what they did. Literally. They were hanging up the bag within four hours, and the cells, DMSO included, were given IV. That was the end of that. And they were hoping for a home run. But as we learned, I think the IV route is still valuable, especially for lung ailments. I don't say a pulmonologist here. But for lung ailments, because it makes sense. They all go to the lung. Oh. Yeah. If you have a kidney ailment, is it best to give it to the uh, uh, renal artery it's been sort of kind of tested. It doesn't really make much of a difference because most of the effect that deploy is systemic. So there, I mean, there are different routes that could be pursued, and that's something that can be tested in preclinical models. That would be the irrational approach. Sir? posed is, if somebody has graft versus host disease and I collect her marrow and I grow the mesenchymal cells, aren't those cells all messed up and they won't be useful and are you compelled to use allogeneic? One of my INDs at Emory is to use autologous marrow-derived MSCs in subjects after they develop steroid-resistant graft versus host disease. We published a paper showing that we can collect the marrow, we can grow their MSCs, we can culture expand them, it takes a little bit longer because the, the GVH and the chemo and the radiation did mess them up a little bit, but they do recover. And then we compare them to the MSCs of normal subjects in regards to their immune responsiveness, and they were identical. That informed an IND application that we sent to the FDA 
to use autologous marimaces in subjects with graft versus host disease, and we've treated four patients to date at Emory. And this is precisely the kind of study that I want to bring here so that Mark and his colleagues in pediatric and adult DMT can rapidly adopt so we can continue in that fashion. So the rational approach is to s simply test, yes, yay or nay, are autologous cells in disease X comparable to normal or close to comparable to normal. You definitely don't want to use cells that we contribute to. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Gallopo for an outstanding grand rounds. Thank you very much for attending.